Hi everyone, uh, this is Nabila Lahe from Rehab for All South Africa. We really do apologize for the technical difficulties this evening. And so we have recorded this um, live, which will go up after this. Uh, before we start, I'd like to say, please do follow our pages at Rehab for All South Africa if you have not already. We promote innovation and development around people with disabilities through access to quality support services, through wider collaboration, and through wider use of technology. Now, today we are incredibly honored to have Dr. Sidna Bolton with us. Dr. Dr. Bolton has extensive experience building speech therapy services in the public sector and has developed the largest speech therapy and audiology department in the country over the last 29 years. She was also recently shortlisted as one of the top five integrity icons from, uh, by Accountability Lab South Africa, where her achievements were gained exposure on a national level. Dr. Bolton is a role model to many, many young therapists out there. And over the course of her career, you know, being that she's been able to watch so many patients grow up, uh, generations grow up, and many people use the skills that she has taught them, including children with disabilities. It's therefore a real pleasure to have her with us this evening on Rehab for All South Africa. Dr. Bolton, welcome. It's a real pleasure to have you. Thank you, Nabila. It's, it's my privilege to be here this evening and to share my time with you. And thank you for the opportunity to allow me to share my work experience with you. Fantastic. To start off with, you know, there might be people who are watching this who don't know much about speech therapy services. Can you tell us more about uh, the services that you provide through your department at okay. Chris Hani Baragwana? So the speech therapy and audiology department at Krishani Baragwanath Hospital is part obviously of the largest hospital in the country. So we have a very, very diverse team. When I say that, I mean in terms of age, where people have qualified, the kind of experience that they bring to our department. So we work with um, adults and children who have difficulty with communication and that could be due to various things like a hearing loss, cerebral palsy, Down syndrome, a head injury, a CVA, and apologies if my dogs are adding to, to the interview. But um, it could be a disability due to many things that impacts on one's ability to communicate. And we also work with uh, patients who have difficulty with eating and drinking, um, known as dysphagia. So that could also be as a result of a CVA, a motor neuron disease, or cerebral palsy. And in our department, we have five clinical teams. So just this allows us to, to focus a lot more on patient-centered care, but also develop more specific skills in the area. So we have our adult audiology team who focuses on uh, patients from 18 and above. So that would be screening, identifying hearing loss, diagnosing it, and then following the path of rehabilitation, which includes hearing aids. Our pediatric audiology team, which starts from birth. So we developed um, our hearing screening program over the past two to three years where we were only seeing about 3% of the babies born at Barra. And we now this year have reached 20% of babies who are, are born and their hearings tested before discharge. So that's an achievement we are really, really proud of, but that's because we've collaborated with outside stakeholders to make that possible. We have our pediatric speech therapy team, which sees the largest number of patients in our department. And that is because of the number of neonates that we see in the hospital. So babies affected in terms of prematurity, we would be working on the early attachment, the bonding and facilitating feeding as well. We have our adult speech therapy team, which does really amazing work with inpatients and outpatients and have pioneered services, for example, looking at voice banking for patients with motor neuron disease. We then have the implantable hearing devices team, and that is where our cochlear implant program is held, which is the only fully state-funded program in the country. And we have now reached over 100 patients that have been funded through this program. Um, and our program has also been recognized as one of the best in the country. So I'm, I'm sitting here really proud, but proud because I work with a team of amazing, amazing people who are dedicated. And also not only my department, but the multidisciplinary team that I, I work with as well. 
Yeah. That sounds really incredible, Dr. Bolton. And what an achievement. Can you tell us more about what this department was like when you started there 29 years ago? Oh my word, when you say 29 years ago. So obviously I, I believed in love and fresh air and didn't quite understand what I was getting into. So when I graduated, I, I actually did not apply for a job. Um, and friends of mine called me and said, there's a post here at Barra, why don't you, you come along? So I took a whole month off, um, started working in, in Feb uh, 1991, and there were only about, I think, four other people in the department. And this was speech therapy and audiology for inpatients, outpatients. I was given a, a book um, and I was told, call everybody in this book for an appointment. And it was so sad because people in that book, some of them were waiting up to three to four years for an appointment. Some of them had died while being on this waiting list. So access and to services was just not existing. Speech therapy and audiology in the hospital was not really prioritized. Um, and me coming out from university, I must admit that I didn't fully understand what my role in a South African context was, because within the first two months of working at Barra, I just realized how underprepared I was for the South African context. And it was really difficult. And I think um, staying on, I knew that I had to almost unlearn a lot of what I learned at university mm -hmm. so that I could become more relevant to my context. What so it, it's think, been it's been a wonderful means? journey. That sounds amazing. But what I do think, you think that it means for a therapist to be a South African, uh, you know, to, well, what does it mean yeah. to be a therapist in a South African context? So as a speech know? therapist and audiologist, firstly, we we were trained in a lot of Euro-American ways of looking at things, of looking at development, pull out this beautiful standardized test, and this is how you do it, and this is what you expect according to the norms. But firstly, these aren't South African norms. These tests weren't developed for South African people. The kinds of therapy goals are not relevant uh, within our context. So there were some things that I, I know I initially did in therapy where often parents used to look at me very confused because I didn't understand the context. So the first thing I would say is that when you go in, go in with an open mind to learn. And when I say learn, we, we often think that we need to go in and empower others but we need to be empowered by those that we are working with. So for me, it was learning about Barra, learning about Soweto, learning about the community and just being open. Um, it, it was really difficult. There were many times that, and I still do walk out of a therapy room and I'm not too sure if I did my best, but I think it's that continuous ability to, to question ourselves and, and fill in the gaps in the gaps because we know that there is not a lot of South African literature in rehab, in speech therapy, in audiology, but I don't think as practitioners we should sit back and wait for academics to give us the answers because we are doing the groundwork. For us at Barra, we are seeing the largest number of patients. So the research, the data, what we're doing, the relevance of what we're doing is where we need to, to start publishing and where we need to start challenging the curriculum so that graduates become out more relevant to context. Yeah. Make some really, really important points there, Dr. Baldwin. So can you tell us more from that point onwards? You know, you've realized this and you how did your career progress within, within the department until you reached your current position? Um, so when I went in, um, it took me, I think about a few months to realize that I actually felt like I needed to learn more to be able to do more. So the learning came obviously from, from the colleagues I worked with, from my context, but at that stage at Barrow, we were seeing a large population of children who were school-aged children failing at school, not doing well. But as a speech therapist, I felt that I did not understand the, um, the child in terms of the learning in, in academic sense, reading, writing and spelling and so forth. So I then went on and I registered for a degree in remedial education. And I had to uh, really convince them at WITS because they wanted two years of experience. I then had to give them my one year experience at Barra and I got accepted based on that because I often say one year at Barra is probably equal to 10 years somewhere else. Mm -hmm. Um, and that gave me a really, really good understanding in terms of what it meant to work with families, to look in at a more family-centered focused way of, of um, developing our programs, a lot more consultation. 
So as a result of that, I started doing a lot more parent training and parent workshops. And at that stage, I even worked on a Saturday morning where I just go into Barra and run workshops with parents. Um, I didn't have kids at that stage, so I could do a lot more. Um, but I think that opened up my eyes to speech therapy and audiology took me to a certain threshold, but that I needed to take myself further to be able to give off more. I then obviously realized for myself that pediatrics was, was my passion. Training families, training parents was something that I was very, very passionate about. And at that stage, the Masters for Early Childhood Intervention was being developed at Pretoria University. So I was one of the first to, to register for, for that uh, master's program. So we were sort of the guinea pigs, but I absolutely loved it. It was like when you're sitting in a lecture and you realize, oh, so what I was doing was right. There's someone's theory that actually backs it up because you often do things from, from intuition, from instinct, because it's what makes sense. And later on, you read a paper where someone actually gave it a theoretical framework. So for me, this was... My learning was learning on the ground. And then when I did the masters, getting the theory to back up my, my thinking was, was amazing for me. And then having opportunity to, to go forth and, and do my PhD at Pretoria University as well. Um, and I chose a different university because I, I needed to challenge myself in terms of the program they offered met my needs better. Um, because people often ask me, why didn't you stay at the place you were at? But I think the, the, the early intervention and the focus on, on that for my need at that stage. Um, and yeah, today I can say I'm, I'm very excited to still be a part of Pretoria University. I, I am now a research associate there and I lecture part-time for the, the master's program as well. So it helps me to, to give back. Um, it also helps me to, to teach, which I love, um, and, and grow people in, in our field. That's really amazing. That's really amazing. And, you know, one of the things that also strikes me about you is while doing all of this, you've grown that department from six members to, is it 36 or 39? Uh, yeah, with 39 permanent, well, with uh, 13 community service therapists coming in every year, us having to get to know their names, which usually takes me up to about June. Um, and this year we got additional posts, um, which unfortunately will only last until March, but we were able to retain eight of our community service therapists in COVID posts as well. And that for me would be just such a wonderful thing if our retention of community service therapists could be better. Because we invest so much in training these young people, and I think it takes them a lot of time to first get used to the public sector, start developing a passion for what they do, and then we say bye. Um, and especially for, for people finding jobs after community service, it's really, really hard, especially for audiologists, because to set up an audiology practice is really expensive. And one thing that we've, we've come across and call a spade a spade, there still is a lot of racism within our profession, because we'll see adverts for job that clearly says they're looking for an African speaking therapist. And most of our graduates don't speak Afrikaans. So excluding people by language has become a new way of excluding people into the job market. So mm -hmm. I think we, there's just so many challenges and so many more conversations we need to have. And I think we need to have them quite honestly within our professional forum so that we can bring about the change that we all strive about. Um, we've arrived, we have our democracy, we talk about transformation, but I think we, we truly need to ask the question, have we truly transformed? Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's a really, really great question. So, you know, being a health professional myself, and I'll tell you that, you know, once you're in private sector, uh, the, the public sector, there's a lot of challenges, but many of us do want to stay there, but they often aren't posts, and there's also no yeah. encouragement to stay there. Um, yeah. It's very, very seldom that you've got someone of great experience and passion, you know, as, as, your, as your colleagues do. What, what advice would you have, for example, for a community service therapist who wants to, or anyone who wants to try and open up more posts in their department? How does one go about yeah. doing that effectively? I think my biggest lesson um, initially is that I used to try and fight my battles with emotion. So I'd get angry and I'd try and make my point. And um, there was one doctor who who's even said to me, sometimes 
he has more difficulty dealing with the emotions of therapists than he does with, with parents. Um, and I think what, what I learned from that is that when you go to the table to ask for something, you have to go with your facts. You have to show why you are needed. You have to show that if whatever it is that you are, are providing is not provided, this will be the impact. So it's almost like building an investment case for rehabilitation. For, so for example, for our cochlear implant program, we had to do a lot of research. We had to draw up a business plan. We had to do things that was definitely out of our, our field in term, terms of understanding the economics of it. And mm -hmm. I think that's one of the things about our, our training that, that I'd really love for us to improve is understand economics of healthcare. Because when we've got to motivate for a program, the first thing they ask us is how much is it going to cost? The question they don't ask is, if we don't provide this, what is the cost going to be? And that is often that in terms of rehab, where it's not looked at. So if you don't provide early intervention, what is the long-term cost on the state? And it's a lot more than putting that money early in and investing early. So keeping good statistics, keeping good records of, of what you do, ensuring that you don't function in a silo. So not just a speech therapy and audiology, that you fight your battles with occupational therapy, with physiotherapy, that you develop a rehab identity within your hospital. That you also, with that, bring your patients on board. Because when you, you fight your battles with your patients and your patients become your voice as well, there's a, a better chance of, of you being heard. So I think it's, it's don't operate in a silo, keep your facts, do your research, make sure that you, you continue reading, you continue understanding your area of work and that you, you challenge yourself in your own thinking. So it's not just that this would be nice to have, but this would be important because of X, Y, Z. This would prevent um, this from happening. And that is why it's important to have this kind of service, to have this kind of machine. So I know years ago when we had to uh, motivate for getting um, a video fluoroscopy service going at Barra, it was a huge, huge battle. We had to get radiographers and radiologists and so many other people to, to support us. Um, and I think that is the important thing is, is ensuring that others understand where we fit into the healthcare system as well, so that they fight our battles with us. Um, and that's so important. Yeah. I think it's really important what's so coming through so strongly, Dr. Bolton, is what you bring into it and, and the energy and the thinking that you bring to it is essentially what you're getting back from it on the other side. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I think don't, yeah. don't apologize for your seat at the table. I remember sitting in our management meetings and almost feeling like the Cinderella of the hospital in terms of, you know, we, we're sorry, but can you maybe give us two more hearing aids? Um, but then I had to change. I had to believe that I have a right to be here in this hospital. I have a right for you to give me a slice of that budget because my patients have a right. Communication is a basic human right. Um, I was asked at one stage, oh, so why can't your patients just get one hearing aid? Um, and I said, okay, so when they get spectacles, do you let them walk out with one lens? Um, Cochlear implants was questioned in terms of, oh, is it just for cosmetic purposes? So the right to hearing, the right to communication, and I think developing that understanding that we're also working from a human rights perspective is so important. Um, and ensuring that our patients come first and what we do as the patients in the center of, of the battles that we, we fight. And this speaks so strongly to your point that you made earlier, Dr. Bolton, about what it means to be a therapist in a South African context. It's, yeah. it's very different to what you cannot imagine yourself as if you're working in a first world country because oh, you, no, people down. You, need, you need passion, you need purpose, you need, you need to drop the ego very early on mm -hmm. um, because you need to learn. You need to be willing to learn from others. And the exciting thing about having new people come into our department as well is that they challenge our thinking um, because we could operate in the exact same way every single year, but then we're not changing, we're not growing, we're not developing, and we owe this to our patients. Um, we need to ensure that they get the best possible service available. 
And, and we can only do that by ensuring that we are, are always keeping our research updated and our knowledge updated. And also getting feedback from patients in terms of what we're doing, is it even relevant? Um, and, and that's important. Yeah. Dr. Sedna Balton, I could speak for you with you for an hour. And uh, believe me, I could continue speaking as well. <laughs> and and I would absolutely love to, but I think time is running out now with, with this uh, platform that we're using right now. But I want to say, you know, thank you so much for all the absolute valuable advice that you've given us. And it's just been a wealth of information, you know, for us thank to you. be able to see someone who has succeeded at the level that you have. Um, we thank hope you that you can join us together again. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much and good luck with all your work. You're welcome. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Bye. Bye.